Thank you, Hans, and as usual to you and Gülshin, my thanks for your invitation here. This is an outstanding conference, and uh, particularly this year, I am very happy to be here, and thank you very much. Liberalism, anarchism, and fascism. These are the topics of my speech today. And uh, I'll try to give you a non-conventional look on Italian history. Uh, these three currents of, of Italian politics and thought are very important, although they seem to be forgotten by now. No one is fascist anymore, no one close to no one is anarchist anymore, and no one is liberal if, if there ever was a liberal. So this is the first remark I would like to open my speech with. Is there, has there been a liberal tradition in Italy? The answer is a uh, big no. There hasn't been any liberal tradition. If you mean by liberalism, classical liberalism, the idea of limited government, of fundamental rights, uh, of freedom of speech, respect for private property, and uh, the construction of a government close to the ideas of the American Founding Fathers. We have no tradition whatsoever in this sense in Italy. This is uh, amazing because there were, for sure, some uh, Italian influences, especially on the American Founding Fathers. And I can cite two, two persons. One is Pasquale Paoli, the, the um, freedom fighter in Corsica, who was Italian by, by, by all standards, and who influenced a lot the American Founding Fathers. Still today, there are some Pasquale Paoli societies in, in, uh, in the United States who draw on the, on the ideas of, of uh, Pasquale Paoli, who was a classical, a classical liberal. He fought to free Corsica from the French rule. He lost, as it's as it's known, and, but still his legacy is, is still strong in Corsica. He is called the, the dad of the fatherland there. Another Italian who influenced the uh, American founding fathers a lot in the liberal sense is Cesare Beccaria, a philosopher, a political philosopher, who is very famous uh, for a book about criminal law. And uh, he is one of the main uh, defendants of the Second Amendment of the American Constitution, the ideas that are behind the Second Amendment of the American Constitution, because he made a very convincing case for the right of everyone to possess and bear arms. But these personalities notwithstanding, Italy has no uh, liberal tradition. Uh, yet, if you read history books, you will read about liberal Italy. What is liberal Italy? Li liberal Italy is Italy between 1861, which is the, the foundation date of the unified Italian kingdom, and 1912, which is another uh, important date because uh, in 1912 the electoral suffrage was extended, and with this uh, the um, political classes which dominated Italy up to that time ended. But we will come to that. Uh, why is it called liberal Italy? It was the Italy constructed by Cavour, the, the, the mastermind behind the Italian unification. And if you compare Italy of that times to what we have now, for sure it seems to be liberal. The state, the government, was much more limited in scope and in extension. The average cost of the government was between 5 and 10 percent of GDP, which is paradise compared to what we have now in Italy. Uh, one figure is, is particularly telling. Uh, public employees in 1861 were not more than 50,000 people. Now we have 3.2 million uh, public employees, not calculating in the figures the employees of the many uh, state-owned and uh, local government-owned companies, which are government by all standards. So 
the, 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 the government and the state expanded during the time from 1861 to, to now in an incredible manner. Now we have a fully fledged socialist state with all the shortcomings of socialism and maybe even, even communism. At that time, the government was much smaller, uh, yet the so-called liberal political class built uh, a model of government which was uh, the imitation of the French model. So uh, no local government, no uh, federal states. There had been uh, federalists among the freedom fighters for Italian unification, but this was completely forgotten. The model was the French government and the French state, with the prefects as the main hinge on which the, the government structure was built. The, the prefects were and still are the local representatives of the, of the central government. And they had and have still now extensive police powers. And this was the main structure. So you had a, a strongly centralist government with local representatives of the centralist government. And the imposition of the rules, of the laws of the Piemontese uh, kingdom and of the Piemontese um, system of government on the rest of Italy. Uh, it was not a unification, it was a, a, a war of conquests, basically, especially in southern Italy. And uh, the, the new rulers were the owners of the, of the new country. Uh, there are lots of, of reasons why the Piemontese kings thought that this, this would be a good idea, especially to pay the debts. They could grab all the gold of the, of the southern Italy's kingdom. Uh, and they could take over all the resources of other local governments. Um, Italian unification was mainly staged by the French and by the British Secret Service, who still continue to exercise uh, a very strong influence on Italian politics and, and on whatever is going on in Italy. Uh, just to, to make a little parenthesis, you heard about the, the fact of the, of the sailing yacht of David Lynch, which uh, was, uh, went down in, in southern Italy in, the, in front of Palermo, and with the death of a person like Lynch. Uh, the first ones to come on the so-called crime scene were the British Secret Service. What they were doing there in Italy is a big question mark, but still, this is what happened and what still happens. So, um, Italian, the so-called liberal Italy did things which are not liberal by all standards. For example, one of the leading politicians during the first years of the Italian unification was Francesco Crispi, who was the main proponent of the Italian colonial adventures in Africa. It Italy was one of the countries, like Germany, to struggle for a place in the sun. They wanted their colonial possessions in, in Africa as well. This has nothing to do with classical liberalism. This has to do with the building of, of an empire. And it, Italy wanted to be a small empire, wanted to participate in the great concert of the big powers of, of the late 19th century. Um, notwithstanding this development of Italy, in the reality, the crisis was big. Uh, after unification, there were 10 years of civil war in southern Italy. They are described in history books as criminality. The uh, resistance against the conquest is usually described as the, the brigands, the, the, the criminals. In fact, it was a resistance movement against a military occupation. And when, at the end, the Piemontese won the war, it was a very hard and difficult guerrilla war because the, the regular Piemontese army had no means to, to deal and to cope with, uh, with the guerrilla fighters. At the end, they won because they had more money, more weapons, and so on. Uh, a huge and massive emigration began from southern Italy to Argentina, to the United States. And this is the main cause of the big movement of Italian emigration to, to other countries. 
Uh, plus, there was the, the king and the, the, the political party of the king. The king uh, at that time was a constitutional king, but still he uh, retained some powers. And especially the first Italian king, Victor Emmanuel II, who kept the, the numeration of two because he felt himself to be rightfully the, the king of, of Piedmont, not of Italy. That's why he called himself number two. Um, he uh, was convinced to be a big military leader. He was a very mediocre general, and if you look at the story of the wars uh, by which Italy uh, gained independence, they were won mainly by the French, not by the Italians. They were very poorly managed, and um, especially for the, the parts of Italy which were formerly uh, under the Austrian rule, they were an unmitigated disaster. With some regions, especially uh, Veneto, the, the region of, of Venice, who uh, were um, annexed, annexed to Italy by means of fake plebiscites. The, the, the elections by which Italy, the connection to Italy won with majorities of 95, 98%, were fake. There are lots of researches about this. Uh, cities with 10,000 uh, inhabitants, there were 12,000 votes in favor of, of, uh, of Italy. We saw, see similar things even in the United States now. Maybe there were some dead people voting at that time too, but still it was a giant fraud. And uh, this is one of the reasons we have a quite strong independentist movement in Veneto. Uh, although we have a party in Italy now, the former Lega Nord, the, uh, the Lega of the North, who uh, is in charge of making sure that all independentist movements of, of uh, northern Italy are kept well under control and that they uh, do not achieve their, their goals. But um, King Victor Emmanuel thought he was a big military leader. There's a quote from his wife, the Queen Margherita, who said, my husband is the last medieval ruler of Italy. And this is how he perceived himself. In fact, the House of Savoia was the oldest um, reigning dynasty in Europe. And he thought to be a, a big general. And this idea was uh, transformed into a very uh, efficient propaganda. There was a pro-war and pro-army propaganda in Italy, uh, especially aimed at transforming the Italians in a warlike nation, which was, and is still is, completely out of, the, out, out of the question. But there was this idea that even if the wars of independence did not achieve the forging of a, of a nation, of a strong nation, this would come in a future big European war. And this is what they thought to achieve with World War I. So there are no liberals in Italy. What, what is described as uh, Italian, as the liberal Italy is, is nothing of the sort. Liberals came later. There have been very important liberals, especially in their influence, uh, in the world, we can think of the names of Bruno Leoni, of Sergio Ricossa, but this is history of the last 50, 60 years. And they have no political influence whatsoever. The Liberal Party, in fact, was founded in 1922. And uh, at that time, owing to the extension of the, of the uh, voting rights, the liberals had no influence. The, the two big parties were the Catholics and the Socialists, which would later become communists. How uh, fit the anarchists in this general description? The traditional Italian anarchists of the, 18th, uh, of the 19th century uh, were uh, an outcome, a result of the, of the communists. The man who introduced Anarchy to Italy is a Russian. Uh, it's Mikhail Bakunin, who uh, had lots of Italian friends. He lived in Italy for a long time. He lived also in Lugano, in the Italian part of Switzerland, for, the lo for a long time. And he was part of the international anarchist movement, which 
was born together with the first international. First international is the communist international, the, the great force behind the, the first, the second, and then the third international were the Marxists. At that time, uh, Karl Marx and, and, and Friedrich Engels were the big part of the international. Uh, but uh, the anarchists, and especially uh, Bakunin, Kropotkin, the, the Russian anarchists, and other the French anarchists, they recognized immediately that uh, the aim of the communists was not to free anyone from uh, some sort of government and coercion, but it was, on the opposite, the idea of building a different type of, of government. Already in the first international and then in the second international, when the communists kicked the anarchists out, there was a very uh, strong discussion between communists and anarchists, and the anarchists recognized easily what the communists had in mind. There are some very interesting writings of, of uh, Mikhail Bakunin, and he said, Marx is a, is a dictator in, in making. He will be a dictator. He has an extensive network of spies and policemen. That's very interesting. Already in the 1860s and 70s, uh, Marx was thinking about the construction of a secret police. This would be then the, the model that was followed by, by the Russians and by most communist regimes. And he wants to suppress any free discussion and especially what, he, what the aim of the Marxists, of the communists is, is to build up the dictatorship of the proletarians, which doesn't mean anything, as the dictatorship of a new elite, which will just substitute the uh, old elite. And uh, what is most interesting in the, in the anarchist um, discussion with the Marxists is that they already saw that one of the main aims of the communists would be to be in charge of the money production. They said they will print their own money with their own central banks. They will own all the means of production, all the, all the factories and so on. And this led to, uh, to, to bitter fights between anarchists and, communism and, commun and communists and eventually to the kicking out of the anarchists from the, from the, um, from the Second International. So who were the Italian anarchists and what did they want? What did they do? They were, uh, you, you see the pictures, they are very fascinating because you see these guys from the 19th century with big black beards and mustache and, uh, but everyone was like that at that time. And uh, they were mainly middle class. There were lots of professionals, lots of uh, small landowners, some were quite rich, for example, Carlo Cafiero, who was the main sponsor of, of uh, Bakunin. He paid everything for him, including a, a famous, very nice villa in Lugano, La Collegiata, where there was this little anarchist community. Some say that Bakunin exaggerated in his, uh, in his uh, exploitation of Cafiero's generosity, but in fact, they put their money, their effort, their time in, in, this, uh, in this enterprise. There were lots of lawyers like me, uh, Pietro Gori, for example, or the most famous one, Francesco Saverio Merlino. They were very successful in defending their clients, their anarchist clients. One could uh, maliciously note that the ones who actually did the assassinations and who were arrested and, and often executed, they were all lower class, so they were not lawyers, they were not uh, landowners, but they were more uh, factory workers or, 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 or agriculturals and so on. But this is maybe it's just a malicious uh, note by me. Uh, what did they want? The anarchists wanted a social revolution. They thought to convince the broad masses of the people to start uh, a violent revolution against the status quo in order to abolish government, to abolish coercion, and to abolish private property. Here we have to in introduce something. Uh, the anarchists of the 19th century were complete economic ignoramuses. 
they missed the marginalist revolution, they missed what the Austrians, what the early Austrians wrote about money, for example. Uh, be aware, they were all uh, cosmopolitan people, they spoke many languages, most of them could speak five, six, seven languages, so it's not that they were isolated in their small Italian world, they could have read the books by Karl Menger easily, but they missed this completely. They were strictly connected to the labor theory of value, they thought that the, that the value of anything comes from the work that is put inside, and they thought along with the communists that there is an exploitation of the uh, owners of the means of production against the, the poor workers. This is what they say and what they continue to say. However, especially regarding private property that they thought would have needed to be abolished, uh, they are not so distant from what we anarcho capitalists think. There are some passages of maybe the most prominent Italian anarchist Enrico Malatesta, who uh, explained what he meant by abolition of private property. First, he said, we dream of a society where there will be independent communities of producers uh, without any coercion. And they will, he said, they will choose communism voluntarily. There is no coercion in the, in the anarchist program. And then he explains what is the private property what we are, that we are against. He says, it's the private property of the Rothschilds, of the owners of the central banks. It's the private property based on government privilege, based on the exploitation of the, of the, of, on the expropriation uh, by the government. So they are not so far, for example, from what Murray Rothbard wrote. He said, there is a presumption of legitimacy in any arrangement about private property, but then we have to look where the private property comes from, and if this private property is acquired through coercion, extortion, theft, fraud, and so on, the owners need to be restored and the situation has to be reintegrated as it was before. That's why, this is one of the reasons, at least I like to, to give this interpretation, why Malatesta was one of the proponents of anarchy without adjectives. You know that the different sorts of anarchism, they are divided. You have feminist anarchists, queer anarchists, gay anarchists, communist anarchists, individualist anarchists, and anarcho-capitalists. But he said, this, is, this doesn't make sense. We anarchists have one common goal, which is abolition of the governments and of, of all uh, coercive structures. How the world will look like later, we don't know, because it will be a free world and we need to leave the, the free interplay of, of human ingenuity. And further, he said, anyone who produces anything is the legitimate owner of whatever is produced. So this is, again, very Lockean, it seems like the, the homesteading theory. So they were not that far away from, from uh, anarcho-capitalists. Their aim was, as I said, social revolution. Another aim that they had, it was to destabilize the system by famous assassinations. And this is maybe the part where the Italian anarchists are more famous in the, in the world, uh, because they are the, the protagonists of successful assassinations. We have, for example, the French president François Carnot, who was murdered by an anarchist, Sante Caserio, who was executed in France. Uh, we have Luigi Lucchini, who killed uh, Empress Sissi. And we have maybe uh, the two most famous uh, assass assassins, which were Luigi Passanante, who attempted to kill the Italian king, Umberto I. And we have Gaetano Bresci, who actually succeeded in, in, killing, in killing the king. Just a, a, a parenthesis, again, the, the sister of Sissi, uh, the Queen Sophia of southern Italy, she was the, the wife of um, King Francis, the last king of, of uh, the Sicilian and Neapolitan uh, kingdom. She, later in her life, uh, they were both, they were one of the few uh, public figures of uh, Italian history which 
uh, maintain their dignity in fighting against what was, what was happening against them. Uh, after the death of uh, King Francis, she uh, went to Paris, where she had... Uh, they, they were expropriated of everything. Huh? This is, has to be borne in mind. Uh, the Piemontese offered Francis to give him back his palaces, his riches, in, change, in exchange for his renunciation to his claim on the throne of southern Italy. And he refused. He said, uh, dignity cannot be bought by gold. So he was one of the few persons who wasn't willing to sell his dignity in Italian history. And uh, she lived in Paris, and she became a close friend to the anarchists. Why? Because the anarchists were against the kingdom of Italy, which she, she loathed and hated with all her forces. And she actually gave lots of money to the anarchists. She was a good friend to Enrico Malatesta. That's why she was called the queen of the anarchists. It is funny because her sister was actually murdered by, by one of them. Uh, Gaetano Bresci, as I told, is the most famous because he, he managed to kill the king, Umberto I. Uh, in, in 1898, there were some protests against stupid government policies as usual because the Italian government has imposed a tariff on imports of wheat and flour because they wanted to protect local agriculture. Uh, when there were some bad harvests in Italy in, 19, in 1897 and 1898, uh, the price went up, of course, because there was a shortage and people claimed for a reduction or abolition of the tariffs and to have, to have lower prices and to enable common people to buy bread. Bread was the main staple for all poor Italians. They ate just bread, maybe an onion, but that's it. Um, when there were these revolts in, Milan, in Milano in the first days of May 1898, the king, Umberto Primo, thought that the best way would be to impose martial law. He appointed a general. Fiorenzo Bava Beccaris, to suppress all revolts. The general did it his way with cavalry, with cannons. He shot with the cannons on the peaceful protesters, unarmed protesters, killing, according to the best uh, estimates, 400 people and uh, injuring thousands. And after this uh, bravery piece by, by the general, he was awarded by a medal from the, from the king. So there was a diffuse sentiment in favor of anarchists during that, the time. Uh, Bereshi was, when he managed to kill the king because of these facts, it was a revenge against the facts of Milano, he was celebrated like a hero. And... Uh, there was, uh, there is a theory, which probably is true. Uh, he, he was very successfully defended by Francesco Saverio Merlino, an anarchist lawyer. He wasn't condemned to death, which seemed to be the, the most likely outcome, but he got life. And in prison, he continued to exercise, to uh, be in a very strong physical uh, condition. And uh, most think that there was a plan to free Bresci, and this would have been uh, the, the spark for the revolution. Uh, he was under constant watch uh, by, by a prison guard, and strangely, uh, in 10 minutes that the prison guard was distracted, he uh, managed to kill himself and uh, put in an end to this plan. Um, the anarchists were among the Italian political movements which were against the intervention of Italy in World War I. They were strictly opposed to it, and uh, they uh, were the main opponents of the force behind the intervention, which were the fascists. Fascism was born in Italy in 1914 and 1915, when uh, lots of Italians clamored to enter World War I. This is the birth uh, hour of fascism. Mussolini famously changed his position. He was, before he was against intervention, he was socialist, he was a prominent figure of the uh, Socialist Party. He changed completely idea, 
Some say against uh, probably conspiracy theorists that this uh, was because he got money from the French. They paid him a monthly allowance to, to, to change his position. And he decided to go in favor of, of intervention. Um, the socialists were in a position, yes, they were against, but not so much. They were in favor of neutrality. At the end, as it is commonly known, Italian entered World War I. Pope Benedict XV said this is a useless massacre, which is true. Uh, more than 700,000 Italian uh, young men and sometimes also teenagers lost their life and millions were maimed for their lives. And um, another uh, important um, moment in the, in the story of World War I was the Battle of Caporetto for us Italians and uh, I don't know the number, Isonzo Schlacht for the, for the Austrians. Italy was uh, defeated by the, by the Austrians and the Germans and at that time, uh, Italy had been uh, really a few days, a few minutes away from a big revolution because the soldiers were, uh, wouldn't accept the ruthless discipline. Uh, Italian discipline in World War I was the worst in the, in the, the history of the war. And they uh, thought to rebel against their generals. They didn't do it at the end. Uh, Italy regrouped, the Italian army regrouped around the uh, Piave and uh, they supposedly won the war. I am not of this opinion. They uh, marched through the Austrian lines when Austria was already in, in disarray. But still, they were considered one of the, of the winning forces. After the war, you had the usual high inflation because Italy uh, borrowed lots of money and printed money. Uh, price inflation, especially regarding uh, food and, and uh, staples of, of first necessity. And this sparked a widespread re re rebellion, which is called the, the Red Two Years, Bienio Rosso. Um, they, the workers occupied the factories and Italy was on the brink of, uh, of a revolution like the, the revolution in Russia. Uh, what happened is that the, the main force against the, the revolutionaries were the fascists. You remember probably the judgment of von Mises who said, I'd rather have Mussolini than, than the Bolshevists. But um, maybe it was a misjudgment. At that time it made sense, of course, especially judging from the later history of Italy. Uh, the establishment managed to strike a deal with the communists and with the socialists who didn't push on, on, on a revolution. The only ones who remained consistently pro-revolution were the anarchists, who at that time had a huge fo popular following. We cannot even imagine a situation like this. The anarchists were popular. For example, in all the, the trials, they were always uh, acquitted by the courts because they didn't have the courage to, to, to condemn the anarchists. There was a big anarchist movement. So what happened, and this is the conclusion of my thought, they organized a false flag, which is the, the best solution. Um, at that time, the chief of the police of Milano, Giovanni Guasti, Gasti, was a very close friend of Mussolini. He had weekly uh, interviews with Mussolini to organize the, the resistance against the revolution. And uh, he had his, these meetings in a hotel in Milano, the Hotel Diana. Uh, Malatesta and other uh, anarchist leaders had been arrested and they were in prison and they protested against the fact that the public prosecutor did not uh, raise charges against them and they started a hunger strike. Uh, this led to a widespread alarm about especially Malatesta's death, who was uh, more than 70 years old at that time. And uh, some anarchists, this is allegedly according to the trial, 
uh, organized uh, 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 an attack at this hotel on, in, with the intention to kill Mussolini and the chief of the police. In fact, Cherchez la femme, as you can see, there was a very mysterious woman behind Malatesta and uh, the anarchists, a lady called Elena Melli. He was, she was 35 younger than, years younger than Malatesta, and she was, according to what they write, very beautiful and very, uh, had a great influence on the anarchists. And she convinced uh, a few perpetrators to leave a, a big luggage with uh, dynamite in front of this Hotel Diana, which had also a theater. And uh, on an evening where the theater would stage uh, uh, an opera by Franz Lehár, the Blue Mazurk, uh, the uh, luggage went off and killed 21 persons and injured more than 100 persons. Immediately, the fascists arrested all possible anarchists around Italy and a very strong smear campaign against the anarchists was organized. Since then, anarchism is dead as liberalism was in Italy. And uh, the facts of the, of the, of the uh, Diana attack made sure that the road was paved for Mussolini. Uh, the idea was that the fascists were the only ones who could guarantee uh, peace and social order in Italy. And uh, one year later, the successful march on Rome enthroned Mussolini as the ruler of Italy. The first three years were a little bit um, moderate. Since 1925, he enacted a through totalitarian dictatorship. The anarchists' ideas are dead. Since then, there are still anarchists who continue in the tradition of the 19th century. But I like to think that anarchism is born again not so many years ago with anarcho-capitalists. We are um, in a completely different tradition. We come from the American tradition, Rothbard, and then from Mises, Austrian School of Economics. Uh, the Italian libertarian mo movement, which is a strongly anarchist movement founded by Leonardo Facco and presided by me during these years, we are trying to revive Itali uh, um, Italian anarchism and to revive anarchist ideas on a completely different uh, way than the, the 18th century, 19th century anarchists who had the problem of not understanding anything about economics. We think that we understand a little bit more and maybe the connection between liberal ideas and Austrian school ideas and the anarchist idea could be a hope for our future. Thank you for your attention.